What is going on, y'all? I have what might be the most unorthodox interview that has ever taken place on this channel so far, and I'm super excited for it. Uh, we're going to have to do a little background. We're going to have to give you all a little story about how this is going down. Uh, but long and short, my guy, can you please uh, introduce yourself for everybody? Hey, what's up, y'all? Uh, my online handle is homozygote. My actual name is Marcus. Uh, I'm a current PhD candidate at the University of Vermont uh, in the tail end of my fourth year. Uh, kind of in my spare time, I like to actually engage in the science communication. I talk about science. I talk about uh, nerd shit, really. I talk about a lot of uh, pandemic-related things and other scientific issues online, uh, simply because I don't think scientists do a very good job of it. So I try to go to all sorts of different corners of the internet to spread the good word of science. And he landed here, baby. So we're gonna pick his brain. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy we get the opportunity. I'm not super happy because we're doing this because I got really sick. So I'm not excited about why we're doing this. I would have rather have not almost fucking died and had this conversation. But since it happened, uh, getting the chance to kind of like share not only my personal life experiences with the gang. A lot of my life is super transparent. Um, you know, being an online personality and everything like that. I did. I have some genuine personal questions that I have not really ever had a chance to pick it. I'm not a political person i'm not somebody who gets a conspiracy there's nothing like, that. like i'm not in any of those spheres where these conversations are normal for us right uh so just to give you guys the background about this uh, i got hit up originally by a mutual uh who's a fan of the channel and also an associate uh of my guy here and basically i was like nah there's no reason for me to talk to him it doesn't make sense to do an interview because i'm not you know what I mean? like what I'm, I'm a music guy like you know what i mean like it wasn't relevant to what we were doing Fast forward, and we had two prominent hip-hop cats get into a debate on Twitter uh, about whether or not COVID was real, whether, or, you know, I mean, where the numbers were coming from, things of that nature. They got, uh, I think they tend more to the conspiracy theory side of the debates um, instead of, you know, necessarily searching for answers in an earnest way that I felt. Um, so I watched probably about half of it before I got just skeeved of it and then left. Uh, and then I got COVID, like, real bad. So I think I had COVID originally, right, it came out in March of 2020. I had it that November before then, before they had a name for it, before it was big or anything like that. I was the sickest I had ever been. Um, and I kind of, like, diagnosed myself with it once COVID became a thing in March. Uh, this is my first time ever having an actual COVID test that said, yes, you are positive, going to the hospital, like, the whole the whole nine yards with it, right? So now I'm like, now I got a horse in this race. Now I got some fucking questions. Um, it makes sense because it was involved in the hip hop community. It was a conversation that I was uh, witness to. And then I got affected directly. So that brings us here, right? Is that, am I missing anything uh, as far as the setup goes that you want to chime in and, and put your two cents in? No, I think that's real. Like it's it's important to kind of ground these conversations in real shit and lived experience because you, you just went through something that unfortunately a lot of people have had the misfortune of going through. And you know, a lot of what uh, science is out here trying to do is prevent people from going through that misery and try to reduce its impact if, unfortunately, it winds up happening. So I think that'll be a, a pretty big cornerstone of the discussion. But uh, broadly speaking, I think you hit all the talking points, and it's nice that you're being like this candid about it because I think a lot of people – uh, they like to pretend like it's not a big deal or, you know, it's just a cold or something. But, you know, this this is real. Like we got million plus dead, a lot of people who are you know living with uh, disability that they didn't have before. And that that affects every corner of society, athletes, musicians, uh, even other scientists, politicians like it, it, it. Nobody really seems to be spared from uh, what this thing can do. So uh, very excited again to the conversation. Cool. Uh, a couple of things that are important for me uh, before we jump into it uh, is number one, like I said, I am not here to push any specific ideology or anything like that to make myself perfectly clear. Uh, my political, religious belief, whatever the fuck you want, I believe in science, right? I also believe that part of science is getting it wrong, admitting when you get it wrong, and then going back and correcting it. It's literally the entire point of science. Um, so what I want to do is answer questions from that perspective. Uh, this is not to change your mind. This is not to try and say that you're wrong or right or blah, 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 blah. This is me having some questions with a guy that's a lot smarter than I am who's in the field. Um, and, uh, hopefully we get to walk away with this a little bit more educated than we were. With that being said, uh, all of the sources for all of the answers, uh, will be put, uh, how are, how are we going to do that? Can you put like a link in the comments or something like that? What's the easiest way to get sources to everybody afterwards? 
Uh, I will I will just send a, a big wall of text with sources in the message. It kind of just depends on what we talk about. So I might have to go fetch something from my, my archive of sources. But uh, I'll get all that to you pretty promptly after we're done. All right. Actually, I'll do this for you. I won't post the video until we have the sources. And they'll be in the description of the video. This way they don't get lost or, or anything like that. Um, so Sweet. all all sources will be put um, your own, uh, if you want to go and kind of talk about your own studies, your own uh, association around COVID, uh, your, what, what is your actual title? You're a microbiologist? Uh, yeah, so I have a bachelor's and a master's in microbiology. So that's, you know, as far as the infectious disease aspect is concerned, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, right now, I'm actually in neuroscience. I kind of get around a little bit in science. I've worked in infectious disease. I've worked in cancer biology, and I currently work in neuroscience. So I'm I'm like the Neapolitan ice cream of science. I come in a couple of different flavors here, but uh, most of my training is in that microbiology area. You know, I've taken uh, all of the the graduate level virology, immunology, microbiology classes that uh, I really could have hoped for in my education, and that made me very well equipped to talk about this when it first dropped. You know, I think that's what really got me interested in talking to other people about science is because I had a, a really perfect skill set for it because uh, of my training and my background. So uh, that that's kind of the, the aspect that I'm coming from here is uh, trying to take actual science and data and then try to translate it into actual English because we don't do a very good job of that in in the field. Cool. Um, all right, let's get into it then. What were, um, I think the easiest transition uh, is just to kind of like let you kind of go off right now. Um, so you you were privy to the the Twitter space debates that were happening amongst different hip hop artists um, for a couple of weeks it was going on, right? Yeah, I know uh, one of them in particular was, I think, really expressing some frustration with talking to COVID-19 conspiracy theorists, whether it's about, you know, the origin of the virus, the vaccines themselves, all sorts of stuff in between. Uh, and that kind of culminated in this Twitter spat where they were tweeting out that, you know, I, I'm sick of talking with conspiracy theorists, with the, all these randoms on Twitter, like I'm only going to talk to somebody with enough clout uh, that has questions about the vaccines or whatever, because I'm just I'm sick of this stuff kind of permeating my spaces, you know, in, in the industry, you know, that person was just sick and tired of it. And then somebody else in the music industry actually took him up on the challenge. And that led to the uh, a pretty infamous now Twitter space. And it was just it was just kind of a disaster across the board. I mean, uh, the the challenger, if we'll, we'll call them that, was spouting every conspiracy theory that you could probably list. Like it was just going down the list. It was almost like a speed run, just trying to get them all out as quick as possible, uh, citing some of the worst sources, you know, anti-vax documentaries, Joe Rogan, uh, and then – the other person, you know, the person who was sick and tired of like defending science to a bunch of randoms on Twitter, they, they had a pretty decent understanding of what was going on. I don't think it was a complete one. And I definitely think they were very much adversarial. It wasn't very genuine. Like the conversation wasn't a, a dialectic back and forth. It was more like, you're stupid. I, I you know, you don't understand this. Uh, you know, this is true. This isn't. And you're, you're kind of a moron for, for thinking this, that, and the other. And while, you know, the facts involved in that discussion were pretty legitimate, it's more about how it was discussed and sort of the dynamic between the two people in the Twitter space. It really wasn't productive. I don't think anybody on either side of that was really approaching it in a good faith manner. Uh, it wasn't something that was for educational purposes, because I'm sure there were tons of people who tuned into this Twitter space, right? Like tons of fans of that both of wanted to learn something, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, if Lupe or if, uh, you know, if people are out here like, essentially saying, you know, I know a bunch of stuff about science on either side of this, you know, it, it never really got emphasized that like one of these sides has a lot more evidence, has a lot more data, has a lot more weight to it than the other one. Like it was just a kind of a shouting match, people talking over each other. None of the details could actually get through to the conversation. And if there was anybody in that Twitter space who wanted to learn anything, I think it was a pretty big missed opportunity to actually teach them. Um I agree with that. I agree with that 100%. I also didn't think it was entertaining, which, like, if you're going to be uh, obstructive, you know what I mean, to, to civil discourse, it should at least be fun to watch. That That's oh, just yeah. me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I I found it to be very – it was like – I felt like a kid watching my fucking parents argue. Like, it was like – you know what I mean? It was like one of those, yeah. like, super, like, ah, I it's wish I wasn't here right now. It was. It super was. All right, so let's get into it. I have no reason to disrespect you. Uh, I will speak my mind. Um, so I, I don't think that we're going to have, uh, the same type of issues. Like we're coming into this under, you know, much, much better pretense than most debates, um, and things of that nature, I think, uh, come across. Um, I'm also not here to debate. I'm, I'm coming from a very uneducated standpoint, uh, which I think a lot of viewership or people who aren't politically charged 
will relate to. Uh, I'm just somebody who's experiencing some shit uh, that, you know, isn't necessarily trying to push people one way or the other. And is just trying to get some understanding. Uh, let, let me ask you sure. this then. What are some of the biggest misconceptions uh, to the to the public in mass uh, that would be valuable for us to go over? And I'm not talking about the people who are plugged in and follow, like I can, and I've never heard of any of those websites that you mentioned. Like that's my point. You know what I mean? Like I'm that yeah, detached yeah, yeah. that we're like I'll read a headline here and there. I got a crazy uncle just like everybody else has a crazy uncle. But outside of that, I don't really tap in with it all. You know what I'm saying? So like from a broad purview, uh, from a broad perspective, what are some of the biggest, most common misconceptions that the average listener would have experienced that we can maybe shed a little bit of light on? Yeah, I think most of them are going to focus around vaccines and masks. I think in that order. Uh, let's start, can... nah, let's switch it up. Let's start with masks because this is one of my points of contention, right? I've I have not seen anyone have this fucking just said <laughs> and then come to the so masks. It's, I was told, and again, this is this, this this is not good research that has been done on my part, just to make that perfectly clear. This is going to be ignorant statements from people who have read Facebook and Reddit headlines. That's the whole <laughs> point of this conversation. All right. Uh, masks. I've heard that it says right on the box, these do not work to help prevent COVID-19. Is that a fact? Does it actually say that in a box or is that a meme that I've seen on Facebook? That's my first question. Yeah, I mean, I've never seen that on a box and I think it might be closer to meme than reality. I think if that has ever been legitimate, it might have been on something that was like made of cloth or like a surgical mask. And when we talk about masks, we have to talk about what kind of masks because there, there's a whole bunch of different ones. And I think really early on in the pandemic, uh, there were actual issues with like making the high quality ones like the supply chain wasn't there. And we had to like ration them for healthcare workers and hospitals and, and clinics and whatnot. So like the average person couldn't get one of those at the very beginning of COVID. And there was a lot of miscommunication around that from officials, including Fauci. Like I will, I'll be perfectly honest, like that man grossly miscommunicated around masks and the things that he said are still with us today. People think that, you know, if you put a mask on, it's going to make you more likely to get sick instead of less. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Like there's uh, actually, I've, recent batch of CDC data that basically confirmed the obvious. Like if you wear a high quality mask, like an N95, a mask that is capable of actually filtering stuff out that's coming at you, surprise, your risk for getting COVID is lower. And it, it's wild to me that something like that from a scientific perspective, it's pretty much common sense. Like anybody with a a, a background in infectious here's, disease, right, well, here, they, know, here's, they know this. Here's, here's the issue with this, right? And when you say things like it's common sense, that does come off a little snarky and we want to avoid that. Um, because like, for instance, this, none of this is common sense. Like, uh, I'll be well, honest I meant, with I meant you. for scientists, like, like for scientists, it should right. be common sense for the, for the everyday That's, person. They have no background in this at all. Exactly. Like you're talking about different types of ma like why? Like that's not something I've ever thought about in my entire life. See, I assume exactly. Exactly. every mask that you wear, whether it's a Halloween mask or a surgical mask or, you know what I'm saying? Like what, whatever the fuck it is that it's stopping shit from hitting your face. And that's the whole point. Right. So. Not, and again, I want to play both sides of the fence because I don't have a horse in this race, right? Yeah, go for, there's, it, go for it. There's at least a little bit of legitimacy then to the conspiracy theory side of things with them coming out and saying, hey, masks without education, without clarification, without an asterisk, without any kind of um, you know, prerequisite of knowledge to be needed. They just said masks become mandatory and it didn't matter. You had people putting diapers over their fit, like literally. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like we've yeah. seen every kind of Walmart fucking walker on the earth that come up with their own variations. But yep. Are they real? Is that really a fault? Like if, if it's, if, if again, if there's this situation where not all masks are made equally, right. right. And, and that's not something that is known to the people. Right. It is a, I think that there's a genuine uh, irresponsibility attached to the, to the mass. You just have to work to, to the mass MASS to the mass concept of you just have to wear a mask, you know, period, and you just take and if you and, and like what you just said and if you don't do it then it's just common sense like you're an asshole i think that's that's a huge part of the divide and, oh, and yeah, yeah yeah i would agree with pretty much everything you said it was irresponsibly communicated from public health officials and uh you know people like fauci you know he's kind of the the figurehead when you think of officials in the beginning of the pandemic he's the first person that always comes to mind and that education was not there like telling people hey look there's different kinds of these things you want to try to wear the better ones if you can, like if you can get a hold of them, that would be better for you. Like that discussion was never had. 
And part of that, again, was because the supply chain, like the actual production of these things in mass so everybody could have like the good quality ones, that wasn't there. So we had to ration them for the healthcare workers and people kind of never were really talking about that until enough time had passed and the supply chain kind of caught up to things and people were actually able to order them online or go buy them from a store. Like that discussion was never had uh, countrywide. And we see the impacts of that every day. Like it's it's wild that people in public health and in science thought that, oh, well, yeah, we'll just tell people to wear a mask. They'll figure it out. Like, no, that, that's not how this goes at all because they don't know what you know. Like you have to sit down with people and tell them like there's different kinds of masks. These are the ones that are higher quality, but we don't have them right now. So here's the best thing that you can do instead. A lot of that discussion happened with like scientists and physicians on Twitter. And that's not a good substitute. Like that is not a good substitute for, for everybody. Cause not everybody's on Twitter, number one. And number two, even if everybody was on Twitter, you know, just having to teach people online is not nearly as effective as media campaigns as you know, the CDC sending official communication to everybody to like making instructional videos on like how to properly put one on, you know, th those things never happened. And people were just kind of left to pick up the pieces and it did not work so well. So it would have really been nice for that information to come from the top down. And Agreed. that's, that's the, that's the communicator's fault. That's public health officials fault. I don't blame the average person for not knowing about different kinds of masks and like how to use them. But then there also comes a point where like, you know, we've been in this for now three plus years, like we're going into the fourth one right now. And even as mask mandates and stuff were rolled out very hastily, haphazardly without that education in tow, there, there comes a point where like eventually you, the individual kind of has to realize that like you said, as long as there's something in front of your face, it's better than nothing. Like that for the most part is kind of how this works. So like something is better than nothing, but that something there's different grades of something, some better than others. So in 2023, I guess my direct question would be, is there a point in wearing a mask in your day-to-day -day life 2023? Oh, yes. I still actually do that. I'm one of the few that uh, definitely masks every day. Um, hell, I was even in my laboratory just before this interview uh, doing stuff, and I was in a mask by myself. Like There was nobody in there with me, and I was still wearing one. And the reason why I do that, you know, I'll, I can only speak for myself in this circumstance, but the reason why I do it is because of long COVID, right? I've had uh, a fair amount of vaccines, so I feel pretty comfortable if I was to ever get it, uh, I would live. I, I'm very confident that I would live. But with that being said, vaccines are not perfect. They don't eliminate the risk of long COVID, which I'll define in just a second, but uh, there's about a 10% chance of getting long COVID, even if you're vaccinated. Now, what long COVID basically means is you have COVID symptoms for a very long time after you get over the initial infection. This is and, what I'm dealing with now. I can't get rid of the chest tightness and the cough was like stayed long after I got negative, long after I got a negative uh, uh, test result. Yeah. And it's wild and it's so variable between people, like different people will have tons of different uh, manifestations, different forms of long COVID. For some people, you know, they have a crippling brain fog where they can't think straight. They can't put sentences together. Like they can't think, uh, you know, some people who are uh, sort of the proverbial white collar worker who like they're thinking for their job, they, they don't have the ability to work anymore because of that, that brain fog. That's one of the most like vicious forms of it. Uh, some people can't even do anything. Like they get, they get super winded and tired just trying to like walk to their bathroom and like back to their couch or their bed. Like it, it's a varying spectrum of uh, essentially being unable to function, and it is qualified or, or classified rather as a disability in pretty much every country now. So this is something that's actually recognized by governments as like so debilitating, so crippling that it impairs a lot of people's day-to-day uh, -day life. I think the the current amount of Americans who have it right now are probably hovering around like 8 9% of the entire country. So like it's a lot of people. So yeah. for me, I don't want that to happen to me. I'm a fairly young person. I would like to think I'm in pretty good health. And whatever I can do to minimize my risk of anything like that happening to me, even if I live after a COVID case, I don't want long COVID. So masks are a really good way to do that, to reduce the risk of me getting COVID in the first place. But, and all right, I accept that as, as an answer, what, when, when we start talking, I got, I want to move on from masks just yet, 
So sure. when we start talking about there's different types of masks, I've seen the I've seen like pamphlets and and emails and shit like that where it's like you you mentioned like an N95. It all looks like Fallout equipment to me. Like like it's all <laughs> I, I I don't know like 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 you know what I'm saying like that was that propaganda wasn't enough to like make me feel one way or another. So as it stands right now, is there any reason? I guess here are my direct questions from a, from a science background. Is there any reason that masks should be mandatory um, in government buildings, in places of employment, office buildings, gyms, um, any, you know what I mean? Like all these like enclosed spaces that are, that are indoor um, occupations. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's a pretty like, I mean, not that you're like, you're not trying to be contentious, but broadly speaking, that question is a very contentious one that people talk about all the time. I still err on the side of it probably should be because it's such a low hanging piece of fruit, you know, like it doesn't necessitate like injecting something into your body. Like it's not something that goes inside of you. It's something that just goes over your nose and mouth and it's something that you can take on and off. So it's not permanent. Uh, I think what you touched on when you said enclosed spaces, that's really the biggest kicker is that when you kind of take a look around, like when you go to the grocery store or the gym, or if you're in school, uh, or if you're a healthcare worker and you work in a hospital or a doctor's office, like a lot of these spaces have really nasty air and, you know, not just the virus That's that facts. causes COVID-19, but like all sorts of germs are in the air. There's pollution in the air. There's allergens. Like the air is just nasty. And I think people don't realize that they should probably like breathe clean air too. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't take a glass of water that's brown and drink it. Like that shit looks disgusting. Of course not. Yeah, so, I think you're. I think you're. You're getting way, way, way off task here, though, because like, I, so like, not not just all right. Maybe that was my fault. The way that I posed the question with with masks in general. So here's here's my question, right? Here, sure, here's sure. what I'm what I'm getting at. In relation to COVID, right? In mm -hmm. relation to the the uh, preventing of spreading and and getting COVID and things of that nature, right? Mm -hmm. COVID is not the biggest disease that we've ever had. COVID is not the uh, the okay. crazy. You, you know what I'm saying? Like. Yeah, Why, like, 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 as far as us creating a new way of life for a specific disease or an outbreak or a pandemic, whatever the case may be, right? Like, like, what is the from? And again, I don't want any political views. I don't care about that, right? I don't even want any morality like reviews. I don't care if you're like, oh, it's the right thing. I don't care about none of that. I'm not a good person. Take all that out. All right. <laughs> from a science standpoint, what is like the tipping point where it's like, here's where, from a scientific standpoint, we have to do this in closed spaces to stop people from dying or to stop people from getting sick, even if death wasn't the end, you know what I'm saying, long COVID, to stop people from getting negative shit in their life. They're having their quality of life reduced, right? right. Why is this different than the flu of 2017 or mad cow? Like, you know what I mean? Like other big name things that I don't understand either. How, like, what is it? What is the point? What is yeah, it? What I mean, is the, the tipping point? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, your, your question makes sense. Uh, and that's kind of where I was getting to probably in like a more roundabout way. But uh, let me just jump right there. I I think there are differences, but also similarities that will add up to that same point that like we should be wearing masks. You know, COVID is not the only virus that can like fuck you up and leave you uh, twisted afterwards. Like the seasonal flu can do it. Uh, mono can do it. Right. There's bacteria that you can get, you know, pneumonia. You can get meningitis like the germs in general are straight up in the air. So like. The hope was that COVID would have been like a collective realization that like, hey, there's shit in the air that's getting us sick. It's killing people. It's leaving people with disability that they didn't have before. COVID's right. just incredibly contagious, and it's one of the most contagious germs that we've seen. I think it's probably you know second to something like measles. So you know we're we're talking about something that is incredibly contagious, and even if it doesn't you know leave piles of bodies you know on every street corner. It's killed a million plus people, and it's left about you know eight nine percent of the population with long COVID, which functionally is a disability and prevents them from working and doing the things that they want. So that that quality of life aspect is, I think, something that people uh, who are making rules like a mask mandate should absolutely consider. Do you want people in the country to like live a good, meaningful, dignified life where they're not hacking up along? They can think straight. They can go to work. They can be productive. They can hang out with their homies. They can do the things that they want to do because long COVID will prevent all of that. So I don't think it's very sustainable uh, for the individual or for a society or everything in between to just let COVID kind of do its thing constantly, even if it isn't killing people, 
it will give people long COVID if you let it. So, so are you that, are you suggesting that we should be masked up? Ten out of ten people should be masked up every day when they step outside. Yeah, I would say as many people as possible, and uh, you know, I, there there are points I think more like on the morality that we could touch on, but we don't want to go there. I yeah. would don't say, don't do that with me because you're going to be real disappointed in me as a human. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we well, we, we lean we tend to be selfish on this side of the street. I'm be honest with you, my guy. <laughs> well, but that's the thing. Like, if if you want to think of it from a selfish perspective, right? Like, let's say you're the only one that matters, right? You you don't want other people to be breathing their shit on you. You don't want to get sick from other people. Everybody who gets COVID gets it from somebody else. You don't want to get other people shit. I I will say this: the concept of living in a society where I have to put a mask on to go outside every day makes me want to put a gun in my mouth. <laughs> and that's that's not that's not from a again like I said it's not like politically charged I don't really it's not I'm pro science so like if it came down to it like I'm not gonna be one of those guys who are like ah I'm fucking breathing radiation just to stick it to the man like that's not my thing right 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 but I but when you say things like I think ten out of ten people should be you know just in general walking outside because air in and itself is is nasty like. That doesn't sound like a fucking society that I want to live in. Like that sounds crazy to me. That sounds like dysutopian to me. Is am I get my am I way off for feeling that way? Or are you just like so far into it that it's like that this is where you've gotten because maybe you know more? Like, like there's a disconnect between between the two, scientifically speaking. Either it makes sense for everybody to have to mask up every day to go outside, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, what is the point scientifically where it's like, man. There's something that is viral enough in the air. There is enough infected or it's spreading, it's spreading at a speed or like what, what are, what's the criteria to where that, that ideology should be switched over one way or the other? Like how many people have to not have COVID anymore for you to not feel that way? How many people would have to have had COVID to begin with for you to start feeling that way? Yeah, those are really good questions, and I think those are questions that public health officials have actually been very reluctant to answer, and I think it's because there is no right answer, and it's really more of a vibe than people really let on. If I'm talking me personally, uh, the threshold that I always use is a threshold that we already achieved, actually. It was right when the vaccines rolled out, uh, beginning of 2021, going into that summer. We reached 10,000 cases a day or less. Like There there was a time where we had less than 10,000 cases a day. And, you know, contrast that with right now and we're sitting, you know, 100,000 plus and we're undercounting them at that because we've decided we don't want to test things anymore. So with that, I'm going to cut, cut, cut you off right here. Keep that thought, right? Because I want to address the fucking, I can already see the comments that are coming in. Here, here's the rules. You don't get the comment on this if you didn't have COVID because the way that he's talking right now. I didn't give a fuck about statements like that before I got really, really, really sick. I'll be honest with you. You hear 10,000 sick. Your mind can't conceptualize the number 10,000. You can't visualize 10,000 humans in front of you all on their fucking deathbed. Like, like it's just, we just hear numbers and statistics, and it doesn't really mean anything until – I feel like I can't breathe on my own and I'm in bed and I'm not a religious person. I'm like, Hey, look, Hey, big guy, let's, let's have a conversation. Like, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> if you haven't like felt the effects of like seriously having like a terrible COVID attack like that, then don't go talking your shit in the comments to statements like that, because I feel way differently now having experienced it to where I want to sit down and have this conversation. So where I was brushing a lot of this stuff off uh, four months ago, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it does, it changes it. Because you hear shit like, man, it's just the flu or, you know what I mean? Like he alluded to that in the beginning of this conversation. Like it's not that bad, yada, yada, yada. But like, man, that shit almost took me to fuck out. And it made me wake up like, hey, you know what? Maybe I'll put this diaper on my face. I don't know, man, maybe. <laughs> well, that's what the whole go- discussion's about, man. Like it, it's about hoping, or it's about like getting people to the point where you're at now without actually having the COVID infection to show for it. Like. That, I think it's what, very hard. I think it's very it is hard. hard. It's difficult. Like it, it will always be difficult. Like this is definitely not an easy task. And I think that's what a lot of scientists and public health officials really underestimated is that, oh yeah, we can just say these things and people will listen. It's like, well, no, you gotta, you gotta back that up. You gotta tell people why this is necessary. And sometimes that might not always be enough. Here's, here's the issue here. Uh, and when I say I'm pro science, one of the things I said this right in the beginning, one of the things I love about science is that science is allowed to be wrong. And when they are wrong, it is understood that we'll acknowledge that it is wrong. And then whatever the correct methodology is will be adapted immediately because that's the correct methodology. Uh, our government officials don't operate the same way, right? So like, I, I think that 
from the people who are pro science and tend to be leaning more towards being pro vaccine and things of that nature, I don't think that there is enough credence given to to the fact that the public should have a healthy not a, not hey, that's the key word here should have a healthy speculation on information coming from the government. The first topic that we talked about was about masks, and the entire conversation is about how the government did not fulfill their due diligence and making sure that that was understood what they mean by that, why they're saying it, what the purpose is, you know what I mean? And then just trying to strong arm it. So like you say this, <laughs> but like, man, you got to give at least a little bit of leeway towards like, maybe you don't believe everything that comes out of the government's mouth the second that they issue it. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah. yeah. And uh, trusting government has actually been a very big predicting factor as to how people will behave during the pandemic, whether it's masks, vaccines, or anything else. Uh, trusting government is absolutely like a key component of this discussion. And I think it is fair for people to have a healthy skepticism of both government and science. I am very critical of both of those uh, very frequently as a scientist. I you know, I am trained to be very critical of pretty much everything, and I kind of wish people had a healthier skepticism, right? There, there's a saying that I like, uh, you want to keep an open mind, but a mind shouldn't be so open that everything in there falls out. So, you know, you kind of have to... I like it. You, you have to be open to, like, new information and new perspectives, but at the same time, if we're talking, like, government and how government is using science to kind of uh, set the pace, set the tone, and tell people what to do... Uh, where people should direct their skepticism is like, okay, what's the justification for insert action here? There's science behind it. Okay, how do the scientists know what they know? How how did the scientists figure that out? And that's what's really nice about science is that scientific data, assuming everything checks out with peer review and the scientific community is generally okay with a, a particular study or a recommendation based on established science. It's true, regardless of whether people trust the government or not. And I, I really like how you framed it because you framed government and science as different groups. Like those are there, there are scientists who work for the government, but ultimately, like a scientist on a lab bench toiling away is not the same as like a congressperson, as like a senator, or right. you know somebody appointed to lead an agency. And I think a lot of that's been twisted. That the science behind why masks are good, why vaccines are good has been mixed up with like, well, I don't trust the government and the government's agreeing with the science. So the science is also wrong too. And that's not the case. Like you can, you can see the scientific data for what they are, recognize it as true and still be skeptical of government's uh, use or intention with it. But I think in a pandemic setting where we're talking about people dying, usually how government would incorporate science would be an effort to keep people alive. You know, I think the the nefarious intent uh, is less in a situation like that until you bring vaccines into the equation, because then the conspiracy theory drives that discussion in a whole different direction. Well, I mean, we can, we can get to that, but like, even without yeah. doing that, I would say that the ball was already dropped on that with the message. Like, like I don't want to move yeah, on. This agreed. Is one of, I would agree. One of, I would agree. One of the biggest issues I have with these de debates, because I don't have a stance, so it's not a debate, but one of these conversations is that people will have an issue or, or, or a topic. It doesn't conclude in the conversation. And then we're already on to the next thing with that. Right. You know what I mean? So like, I will say this, as far as mask goes, I do not feel more motivated from this conversation to, to wear a mask every day. Whatever information was was delivered so far, I, I'm not going outside and putting on a mask tomorrow. Um, is there additional information that you would provide for somebody like me? Now, keep in mind, I, I have the first vax. I have the second vax, right? I'm not somebody who's like anti-science or anything along those things. But from a scientific standpoint, I'm not – I don't believe that the average person that I'm going to see walking around with a mask has one that is um, – of a good enough quality to where it is actually preventing or or doing the things that they think that it's going to. If anything, it feels like more of a virtue signal uh, at this point than it does of someone who's actually doing something to help prevent it. Um, I've already gotten it. When I got, when, having received it, I don't know that having a mask on would have prevented it for me because I was in a place with a lot of kids and kids are fucking kids yeah, they're petri dishes yeah exactly you know what i mean it's so like i feel like that was going to get me no matter what i don't feel like it would have affected you know what i mean the, the, the for me personally my experience with it or anything like that what 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 do i need to hear what is the information that you think somebody should hear 
that would motivate. And again, th this is not to say that you're going to be successful. I'm not looking to change somebody's mind. But if there's additional information that I haven't taken into consideration, I want all of that. I want all of the info so that I can make my own informed decision. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. So let me let me dump a couple of things. Uh, cool. Whether we're talking about immunity that you get from vaccines or immunity that you get from actually getting sick with it, the protection that you have against getting it again disappears after six months. So that's a fact. I did not know that. that yeah, that's most people don't know that. And it's actually something that's been presented in CDC meetings with respect to like Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Uh, and this is this is a feature of the immune system. Like this isn't a COVID specific thing. Your immune system doesn't want to spend all of its time trying to fight something that's not there. You know, it's not going to be chasing. Then how can, how can we ghosts. only need why do we only need one vaccination for polio whatever the fuck else is out there you know what i mean like mumps right, measles. Right, right. like like if it, if it if antibodies are only good for up to six months how come this is the only time why am i only fucking in my 30s when i'm first hearing about this number one <laughs> and then like number two would be then how does like it, how, how does that relate to every other vaccination that we've ever taken yeah, so I mean that that the COVID or that six month number is a COVID specific one. Uh, different germs and vaccines for different germs give you different durations of immunity. Uh, something like measles, right? You get that, and it's like it's a lifetime. Like you're good. Like you don't need any more for the rest of your life. But flu, like the seasonal flu, that shit mutates really quick. It changes, and your immune system kind of needs an update. So that's why they recommend the that flu vaccine sense. every year. COVID's the sense. exact same way. It's always evolving. It's changing. It's morphic. It's very elusive. And that's why we've had like an update to the COVID vaccine. And that's why there's a recommendation that, you know, even if you had the first two at the very beginning, that at the very least, you should get a third uh, they call this the bivalent booster, the bivalent vaccine, where they actually change the contents so that it's a closer match to the current flavors of COVID that are floating around these days. Uh, that that six month number has been a point of uh, contention that like government policymakers just would not admit to like being a driving force. And we're kind of getting into a situation where like they're now just starting to get around on that. So like people who have compromised immune systems and, and whatnot they're getting two vaccines per year like that's the recommendation for them based on that science they're saying look you need one twice a year because it wears off every six months i think that should be for everybody because those people are more vulnerable than the average person but the average person who doesn't have a medical condition the same thing happens it wears off every six months so if we're going back to masks if the immunity wears off every six months you're going to be vulnerable to reinfection so that six month mark passes. And if you're not walking around without a mask, you don't have protection against infection. The protection that you do retain is protection mm -hmm. against going to the hospital and dying. That's always been very good. And if you've had the first two shots and now an infection on top of it, if we're speaking about your case, you'll have good protection against death and severe disease, but your protection against getting it again, well, we're off after that you know, six to seven month time period. And long COVID comes back into the equation at that point too, because if you get it again, you're rolling another set of dice and risking long COVID. So I, that's why I would recommend mask wearing specifically uh, because of that. And then in the future, whether or not the, the vaccine frequency uh, is either two per year or once per year, the government will recommend at least once per year you get a COVID vaccine to account for that. We don't know what direction the virus is going in, so that recommendation might pan out, it might not. But masking doesn't give a damn about which variant. It doesn't give a damn about mutations. Whatever viruses are floating around in the air, a mask will prevent that from getting in you. Like the CDC has when you just say, released data. On when you that. say that, that uh, two times a year is what you would recommend for everybody, not just those with immunocompromised situations, um, are you saying that as a people who want to be proactive or do you think that that should be uh, like state or federally mandated twice a year for population control purposes? Ooh, that's a really good question. I think there, there are different scenarios where I would back either one with reality being the way it is now. I would mandate at least one per year. I think two per year is going to be a really hard sell, and even one per year might be a really hard sell because people are tired and there's take, so much take, misinformation. Take, take, the sell, take the selling out of it because now you sound like you're talking about politics. No sell, no sell involved. You are God. You get to determine the world <laughs> and so on and so forth, right? 
And yeah, okay, I mean, if I'm, that, if I'm that, omnipotent, then I would, I mean, I would mandate two per year if I'm solely talking about science. If we're just speaking solely on the strictly science, science yeah, so yeah, for strictly science, I would mandate two per year. That's because I don't want people getting long COVID because that shit is indefinite for a lot of people. Like you, you can't. I, I want people to have the least risk when, when possible would that for getting COVID. When would that stop? I follow you so far. I follow what you're saying so far. When when would that stop? Or is well, so there's a whole like different discussion to be had that dovetails right in with this. There is a very clear cut need from a scientific perspective to develop what are called second generation vaccines. So that six month number that I just told you, that's a big weakness of mRNA based vaccines is that it, you know, the protection against infection only lasts six months. And even in that six month window, people who are vaccinated, they can still get it. It does not completely prevent getting it and transmitting it because vaccinated people can still spread it. And that was a point of hubris that the CDC didn't admit until summer of 2021. So that's another point where they were wrong. But uh, science has a ton of different strategies to overcome this. There are vaccines that you could essentially like inhale. You could like rip a cloud of a vaccine or you could like spray it up your nose like a nose spray. And that would actually give you immunity in your respiratory tract instead of like in your blood where we get you know, the shots in our arm and our muscle that doesn't give us immunity in our lungs and our throat in our nose very very little immunity exists there so the thought is that like if you made new vaccines that you inhaled through your mouth or through your nose that's where the virus is going to be if you get it it's going to be in your mouth your nose your throat your lungs so if you had immunity where the action's Sense. happening you can actually stop an infection before it starts. And the hope is that the immunity lasts longer than six months. So what I, my perfect world is a world where we do clinical trials for these second generation vaccines. So we don't need to give people a booster twice a year. The hope would be you get one every one to two years and then re-up whenever you need to. We don't know how long that would last because we're not doing the clinical trials to do that. And that's a money and politics issue. Because the sci scientists want to do it. There's a ton of different candidates worldwide uh, in the U.S., Canada, uh, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, China and India, I think, approved uh, two of their own like second-generation vaccines uh, that they're currently using now. So like, it's a, it's a political willpower issue. I won't get too much into that. But like, the science has a bunch of really promising candidates to overcome this. You, know, you have to get a vaccine at twice a year problem. I think science can do better. Mm -hmm. And there's promise there that isn't being followed through on. We have, in, I don't even know where you're located. I'm in the United States. You're, I'm assuming you're also in the United States. Yep. I'm in the state of Vermont for school. Cool. Uh, where are you from? Curiosity. Uh, I was born and raised in uh, suburbs of Denver. Uh, and then I've bounced around since then. I went to school in Oregon, spent some time in Phoenix, Arizona, and then went back to Oregon. And then I went uh, from Oregon to Vermont. So I've, I've bounced around a bit. Gotcha. Here's my only, uh, before we move on to the next topic, my, my, sure. my last spark of brain cells that you just got moving. Go ahead. Here, here's, here's my, my point of contention with what you just said, right? We have a very loose separation of church and state in the United States. Uh, and the reasons for that are plentiful, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I agree with that. I, I think I would like to have religion removed more from politics and more from the voting process. I also think that there probably needs to be a separation of science and state as well. And here's why. And and, and this is something that you you're putting, you know, the, these, these thoughts into my head as I'm listening to this, right? Part of what I love about science is that science is allowed to get it wrong because it's a process of learning, right? So in this scenario that you just uh, explained and everything like that, the, the issue that I have is, yes, we've pointed out issues where the CDC has already been fucking wrong. We've pointed out issues where the government has, uh, even if they weren't necessarily wrong, it wasn't done in a way that was 100% transparent or in a way that was honest, right? There's probably more than a 0% chance that some of this was done on purpose to increase companies' sales of masks that they knew weren't going to prevent COVID but were readily available at the time. Like, there's a not 0% chance that all of this stuff is, um, is, is taking a role in why things happen with the government. Because science allows for things to, to be wrong, there is a chance that we put out a vaccine or something like that that has a really terrible side effect or isn't 100%, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that if science was allowed to do the science thing would have been figured out, you know what I mean, in controlled environments 
But the second that you have a government entity that is now mandating, you know what I mean, things that have not fully gone through the the scientific method, so that we know everything inside and out, and now you're putting a political body in front of it that says that this is a hundred percent necessity for everybody. Well, you're now saying that it's mandatory to do something that we know and one of the things that we love about can be wrong and can be wrong in ways that would kill everybody. Hypothetically, not, there's a not zero percent chance that a wrong vaccine could be created or anything. Take the word. I know people it's supercharged vaccine. There could be fucking anything that could happen that could roll out from science through the government to the people that would be worse if if uh that would be worse in the way that it is now than if science was separate entirely from it and allowed to develop at a rate and and methodology that they know works. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think I said saying. a lot of words. <laughs> I don't no, know I, if I, I got my concept across. No, I'm picking up what you're throwing down. Like, I think that the concern is that if you know government is involving itself in science to fulfill some sort of governmental purpose, then the science is going to be warped and distorted, and that could cause you know, consequences of something like a vaccine being you know rushed through clinical trials or uh, masks being mandated, like a policy being created to like pump up some company's bottom line, and. You know, and that is what we've seen, right? Like we have, if, if that is like, those are, again, this is coming from someone who only reads headlines. Don't fucking crucify me in the comments. Just educate <laughs> me. I'm here. I'm here to be educated, right? My understanding is that those things have all actually happened, that these are not hypotheticals, that these are things that have happened with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine being pushed through. They said it was fucked for one reason or another. I don't really know what it was. They pulled it back at first to manipulate it more before coming back out. The mask things we have already kind of went over, like- that has happened, right? Like that is our current state of affairs. Well, so the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, I think people get that twisted. And I think we might be getting that twisted here. Uh, this Very is actually, possible. I think a, an exercise in like understanding that, like you said, the scientific method, as far as the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is concerned, was actually allowed to proceed. And that scenario is a good example. Uh, what happened with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is that the, the blood clotting stuff, that side effect, which is why it got temporarily pulled from the market. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, that was so infrequent, that was so rare that they did, they were not able to see it in the clinical trials because they did not have enough people in the clinical trials to see it occur at the frequency that it does. So it, first of all, that side effect was so infrequent that they weren't able to detect it in the clinical trials. So I think that's a, a qualifier for like, it's a, it's real shit. Like blood clotting is a big deal. But at the same time, it was infrequent to the point where they weren't able to detect it with a clinical trial that had a pretty decent amount of people in it. But this is an example of the scientific method and how after something gets an approval, in this case for an emergency like the pandemic, they don't just stop there. Like if something gets approved, they don't just, you know wipe the dust off their hands and be like, all right, good job, boys, right. we're done. They still do what's called post-market pharmacovigilance, aka they still keep their eyes peeled for crazy shit happening after the fact. And that blood clotting was one of those events. It was crazy shit. So what happened was they saw this happening and they wanted to make doctors very aware of what was going on. So that like if they got somebody at an emergency room or at their doctor's office who had gotten a Johnson and Johnson the doctors would be more aware as to like what would be going on and what to do because the typical treatment for blood clots would have actually made those people worse and not better. So they had to put a pause on the vaccine, take it off the market, and then sit down and like send memorandums to doctors to be like, all right, here's the situation. We're looking into how this happens, and here's what you need to do from a clinical perspective if you're treating one of these people who like have blood clots or symptoms consistent with it who just got a Johnson & Johnson. Then they – press the, the play button again after that like one to two week pause and then allowed people to continue to to get that vaccine with the doctors being more able to take care of it. But after enough time passed, the government essentially said, okay, well, the side effect profile for mRNA-based vaccines is better. So at this point, we recommend you get one of those. Don't worry about getting a Johnson & Johnson. If that's something you're thinking about, don't do it. Not because it's going to kill you, but because the side effect profile is better and because we have options, there's no reason to force anybody to get Johnson & Johnson specifically. Uh, I think that the broader concern is that like people see situations like that and they say, oh, the clinical trials were rushed to make Johnson & Johnson a bunch of money or Pfizer and Moderna a bunch of money. Oh, look at these side effects. Clearly that was rushed and that was all to pump up their corporate bottom line and make their stock price go up. And I think there there is valid concern to be concerned about the pharmaceutical and biotech industry's motive to uh, get as much profit as possible. I, I 
think that's a very real concern. But we have to square that concern with the actual science behind whether or not these vaccines actually work. This is why I tell people all the time, like we can be skeptical of Pfizer and Moderna. We can hate their executives. We can hate their CEOs while still getting their vaccines. That's a perfectly logical conclusion to come to because they don't give a shit whether you get the vaccines or not. The government paid them for the doses. They've made their money. So like don't own yourself because you hate the pharmaceutical industry. Like make sure you're taking care of you're protected. And that goes into the political realm to advocate for change as far as how those industries are allowed to proceed in society. That makes sense. Like, don't not fuck your ex with good pussy just because she's a bitch. Yeah, I mean, if sex is the name of the game, I gotta tra- yeah. I gotta translate this to my audience, <laughs> my guy. Like, I just I want you to know that I understand what you said, and I'm here with you, and that's my translation for everybody else. Just because you don't like the the bodying, the bad thing, good things can come from bad people. Good things can come from bad yeah, places. That's a really good way they, of phrasing it. And I agree with that. And I think a lot. Of, look, man, there's probably there's a there's a ton of nuance to all of these conversations that Agreed. unfortunately the the dichotomy of the conversation in and of itself is is created with so many volatile politically charged you know i mean avenues that it's it's hard to give hard credence to, to the to the gray exactly you know what i mean like there's, like there's a lot that goes into it all right was there any last points on the mask thing that you wanted to add in for the viewers um yeah i i think the, the last thing i will say is like i know it's kind of an imposition like it's, it's an inconvenience the masks are uncomfortable they're itchy uh they're not the most stylish thing in the world But at the end of the day, like, I would rather look like a dumbass. I would rather be scratching my face all the time. I would rather have this than COVID. Like, the the if we're comparing what's worse, going outside with a mask on your face or getting COVID, COVID is worse 10 times out of 10. The the benefits of wearing a mask for just the person wearing it are through the roof, right? I haven't been sick this entire pandemic because I've been wearing a mask. I haven't gotten COVID. I haven't gotten flu. I haven't gotten a cold. I haven't gotten a damn thing. I think people would do well to like not want to be sick. I think people have a right to not be sick. I think that's a, a pretty reasonable perspective to take. You know, I'm I'm anti-sickness and anti-disease. And I think uh, more people can kind of hop on board with that. They can prevent more of these things. You know, and there's a saying in medicine that like I've heard a lot of doctors use, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, AKA. It's easier to stop wow. these things before they start than to deal with the consequences. So that's what public health is all about. It's about risk reduction, trying to reduce harm as much as possible. So I want people to kind of take away from what I have to say that we know masks work. This is not a scientific debate. Like we're not, the two of us aren't talking about it, but even in the scientific community, the people who are still saying masks don't work are usually like funded by some sort of uh, anti-vax group or something like that to sow discord into the conversation to muddy the waters. We know masks work. There's a a stack of data taller than me that says as much. So I would recommend doing it. And if you were going to take me up on that, uh, wearing an N95 is the way to go. N95s are a good quality mask. You can now actually get them uh, like on Amazon and shit. Like I buy a pack of 20 for 30 bucks. So, you know, it's, it never used to be like that, but now you can buy them in bulk. Uh, they're, they're a lot more yeah, available than they used to be these days. And I can even throw you an Amazon link when we're done if you want them uh, to uh, yeah, slap seriously, into the description. I- Exactly. In the, in the description, links for everything. Like, look, I'm I, regardless of what my opinion is, where you guys fall one side or the other, I want to make sure you have as much resources, uh, as many resources as possible to educate yourself on the conversation beyond what gets discussed right here. Uh, I don't expect my guy. My guy is defending all of science by himself <laughs> to, to a fucking use. You know what I mean? Like, like, I don't expect everything to be perfect, but I expect this to be a good first step into a conversation uh, that you can listen to and be involved with that isn't trying to push you one way or another so that you can start your own education process and then also provide links uh, if you do decide that, um, you know, additional steps for your own and others' protection is necessary in your day-to-day. Does exactly. that make sense? That, that feels good, right? That feels yeah, like that makes, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I'm not here to, to nag or you know, wave my finger at people, but I think there's a lot of information people don't have and that will inform their decisions a lot more. Facts. Cool. Next question that I had. Uh, I read there's there's two there's two weird quirky kind of like things that I read that I kind of wanted clarification on. Uh, okay. The first the first one was that COVID is primarily an issue for fat middle aged people, right? <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna frame this with like the headlines and, and where this this stems from, right? So I read originally that it was almost never found in children for some reason. 
uh, that it was that that kids weren't necessarily the the target. And this could be very, very early pandemic things that I'm remembering right now. Uh, like I said, I have not followed this with a fine tooth comb. I'm just pulling off my general knowledge and information. Um, I heard that it's not really that, that that people who are fit and in shape are much less likely uh, to be as negatively impaired, even if they do catch it, than those who are out of shape, which which could have probably be said about every single disease in the world. Like if you're in good shape, you probably are going to have less downsides than someone who also has health conditions that could be complicated by introducing the outside factors. Uh, I guess my question is, just, is that real? Is that like a real thing? Uh, does COVID primarily have like a targeting system where it's like X, Y, and Z, you're more likely to to be affected than if you're a fucking seven-year-old with a six pack? Or is it just like a, like, is it just like a common sense thing? Like where like healthy people get healthy more, unhealthy people feel unhealthy more type thing that also got applied to this to spark additional conversation. Yeah, so I mean, this is a pretty complicated mix of stuff. So I'll try and address it in the order that you said. Uh, the the children can't get COVID thing that actually has been sourced from like anti vax conspiracy theorists and anti vax like dark money groups. Uh, I could actually probably go like to COVID Twitter and like pull out the specific people who were responsible for kind of seeding this media narrative. Uh, children can get and spread COVID just as easily as anybody else, and in fact, they're actually some of the most predominant spreaders of COVID. Right. Schools are a massive hotspot. I think I can I can dig up some information that actually do like the contact tracing from uh, transmission chains that started in schools and this transmission chains that started in schools stretch longer. Like kids in schools will infect their parents, will infect their teachers who then go on to infect other people like the, the close quarters of where kids go, schools, daycare, stuff like that. There there is no reason why biologically they're exempt from this because they're not. And you can look towards all the kids who have died from COVID. I think we've had like 1,100 plus pediatric deaths alone from COVID in kids, most of them without pre-existing medical conditions. So kids are absolutely a spreader. And that's a, a big piece of misinformation that was used to like keep kids in schools, to advocate against school closures and uh, you know remote learning, remote education. So I would say that's, uh, that's wow. a, a very big myth that has been unfortunately still kind of lingering with us. Now, as far as like, you know, does COVID affect one person or one group of people more than the other? There are definitely risk factors. I mean, age is the biggest one, right? That's why people have kind of jokingly called it the boomer remover. And that's a really awful fucked up nickname. But that is the only way I will be referring to COVID going <laughs> forward. <laughs> but I mean, oh, like, Jesus Christ. I know it's pretty morbid, but I mean, when you do the age breakdown, of course, it's people, you know, 65 plus who are going to have the hardest time with it. And that's why when the vaccines for like, is that a COVID thing or is that just common sense? Like the older you get, the closer you are to death. That just seems like it makes sense to me. I mean, it's a mix of both. I mean, look, the older you get, the longer you've been alive, the higher the odds that you got all sorts of medical conditions going on and your immune system obviously ages with you. So it is not going to be the immune system of a 20 year old if you happen to be like 72, you know, like it's not going to be uh, the youngest immune system ever. So like age is a big risk factor, of course, with a lot of things, including COVID. Uh, being male actually is a bigger risk factor than weight, interestingly enough, because testosterone actually makes a lot of the inflammation worse. So just being male, having testosterone be the dominant sex hormone in your body definitely uh, is a big risk factor. Weight doesn't help either. Uh, of course, pre-existing conditions like asthma, high blood pressure, diabetes, like all of these things are risk factors in and of themselves. And some of these can be additive in nature. So it kind of depends on like the individual that we're talking about. And if we're talking about, like you said, a seven-year-old with a six pack, the chances are they'll probably live and they're not going to have long COVID, but it's not a complete 100% deal. If we contrast that with like, you know, a 20 year old with, I don't know, say asthma, well, they're probably at higher risk because of the asthma. Or if we're talking about a 32 year old with like type one diabetes, well, the diabetes and their blood sugar, that's going to put them at even more risk. Then you kind of go you work your way up more medical conditions and the risk increases. And of course, immunocompromised being one of the biggest risks of all, because if you don't have an immune system to fight it, you're kind of in dire straits from the, from the get go. So it's not like it, it doesn't have a targeting system per se. It's about like what every individual person <clears throat> has got going on relative to their age, their medical conditions uh, and so being their biological seven, sex. Let me, let me rephrase this to see that I'm following. So being 72 does not make you 
more likely to catch COVID than being 30 or being seven makes you to be to catch COVID. However, being 72 makes it incredibly more likely that you have accumulated a number of other things throughout your life that would make COVID a bigger issue for you, or could, I should say, make COVID a bigger issue for you in your 70s than is likely to be present when you were 30 years old. So it's not necessarily the age in and of itself, but it's the the idea that the more shit you have wrong with you or, or going on with you at that time, the more likely you are to to suffer the worst end of the effects of COVID. Yeah, I'd say it's both. I mean, the age itself does contribute to just because again, like even at the age 72, if your immune system is not what it used to be at you know age 20. So just even if you okay. were 72 with no medical conditions, if you were you know fit as an ox and you still you know ran a marathon every day at 72, you would still be at higher risk just because you're 72. Okay. All right. Um, clear and cut. I like that. Uh obesity. If I do not have diabetes, but I am overweight, I am obese. Am I more, is that in and of itself a factor that makes me more vulnerable to COVID, more likely to to get the worst end of the effects, you know, however that was marketed? Yeah, obesity definitely is a risk factor. Uh, I definitely think people are going to try and stratify obesity by like, well, what if it's all muscle? Like, what if it's not fat and what if it's muscle? You know, I just, I have a lot of muscle on me. Muscle weighs more than fat and it pushed me into the obese category, but like I'm lean, my body fat percentage is low. We're not talking about you guys. Fuck you guys. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a gym rat here and you're like, ah, my BMI says I'm overweight, but I'm fucking Junji Mufo and my fucking body mass is nothing but that's not who we're talking about. Go live something. We're not talking to you. No, I'm talking about regular American fat people, dog, the rest of us. Yeah, no, I mean, it's worth mentioning like the, the gym rats just because you'll probably get that in some capacity. So it's always worth saying we're not necessarily talking about the gym rats. But, you know, even then, like there are definitely a lot of anecdotes. I will qualify it by saying anecdotes, not necessarily robust data, but there's anecdotes of people who are, you know, bodybuilders who are just jacked beyond imagination. And then they get COVID and they go to the hospital and they lose every single game that they ever made because they spent two weeks in the hospital because they were on death's doorstep. So like there, right. there, there are some anecdotes of bodybuilders who have met a similar fate. So even then, like there's, it's not a guarantee that if you're lean, you're fit, that you're not going to get the worst end of it. It's not a guarantee that if you're obese and you eat, you know, nothing but Oreos and Doritos, three square meals a day, that you'll get the worst of it. But if you do that latter, your risk of that meeting the worst end of it does go up for sure. All right. I feel like we handled that one pretty quickly. Next, uh, next question, headline slash curiosity that I have. I had read at one point and seen at one point that it said that there were studies, and again, this could be bullshit, fuck you guys ahead of time, <laughs> uh, that people who smoke marijuana or eat edibles that have any kind of an affiliation with THC, that for some reason that having THC in your system was showing to be something, 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 resist COVID-19. Is this just Reddit bullshit that I happen to breeze over? Is there any kind of relevancy to this? What's going on with that? Yeah, it's mostly Reddit bullshit. Where it kind of entered the conversation was that there was like a particular research group that was actually looking at CBD. Uh, they were looking at like various CBD and oils, but they were doing it like in a laboratory, like with a bunch of cells in a Petri dish. It wasn't like a, we took blood from people who smoke a lot or you know, we looked at medical records and found that people who consumed marijuana were at less risk for severe outcomes. Like it wasn't like that. It was just like a one-off laboratory study that didn't involve anything in the real world. And people took that headline and it got absolutely twisted by media and online social media to say that, oh, yeah, you know, CBD is uh, if you smoke weed, you'll be fine. Like it, it, it ain't like that. It Again, when we're talking about smoking, because uh, we're not going to get into the smoking versus edible component of this, but when we're talking about smoking, whether it's weed or anything else, like inhaling burnt shit is not good for your lungs. So you know, when we're, when we're talking about that, about well, COVID thinking, probably, uh, probably yeah. not helping with the lung situation. That makes sense. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's just more like, let, let's just see the forest, uh, for, for the trees. Even if we want to smoke the trees, we still have to see them for what they are. That's fair. Now that's actually a really concise way to shut that down. All right. Now I like that. That's good. Um, issues that I had. All right. So this is going to be a combination of maybe some bullshit that I made up. And maybe something that really happened, but I can't remember anymore. All right. Go so we're we're just going to weasel our way through this. This is how most of your headlines happen anyway. People just make shit up in a fucking room. None of this shit. You know real. it. You know it. Um, I read at some point that 
the federal, and this is probably more of a political statement than a, than a science one. So we might move past this pretty quickly. Uh, but I can tie this into a better science question. So I'm going to give you two at once that, that I want to talk about. So uh, I come across the idea, uh, whether it's from me fucking multiple nurses and having ins with, with hospitals and shit like that. But basically the idea is that the government was funding hospitals who were covering the most for COVID or whatever, so that people were fudging the numbers and claiming that people died of other things and claiming it as COVID so that the numbers of their hospital would show that they had more COVID deaths so that they were dealing with COVID more so that they would be eligible for better funding so that they could get the materials that they need to continue dealing with the pandemic, so on and so forth. Um, I have a lot of information in my head from this topic because I do, I do I have a lot of relationships with beautiful, amazing nurses. I love all of you. So I hear like kind of like the behind the scenes um, the hospital gossip, which could be nothing more than, which you know what I'm saying? Like these aren't like fucking the people who are signing the contracts. These are the workers and stuff like that. So like it is what it is. Um, again, my brain is telling me that there's a not 0% chance that there is absolutely reality based in these claims. Um, and that that is something that would 100% fuel the conspiracy flames and things of that nature because that sounds like something we would do that sounds exactly like something that america would do um yeah what get what what uh so then the 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 science question that's like a, the political side the science question that i have from that afterwards is how like how can you justify some of these conversations that we've had because the numbers are the the, the justification is based on numbers when we now have a logical reason that those numbers would be fudged to begin with that we're now making life-changing and altering decisions like you were quick to drop we had 1100 pediatric deaths like what if that's not the case like those kids could have all been saint jude's cancer kids who were going to die of cancer anyway but happen to have covid and die from the covid three days beforehand so it benefits them to write down that they died of covid and not the stage four cancer they've been fighting for a year so that now that that get, does that make sense do you follow me so far yeah. So, I mean, this stems from uh, what I would I would just like square away, call it a conspiracy theory that like uh, doctors were fudging the numbers and cooking the books to like report more COVID cases than there were. So that way, like the hospitals and the doctors all got a bunch of money and some sort of kickback out of it. Uh, so they had like an incentive, a, a financial incentive to keep doing it. So I think like what you said that like there's some form of reality kind of grounded in this. Uh, this is actually due to legislation. Uh, it was the CARES Act uh, in particular. It gave uh, it gave like hospitals and uh, other like healthcare entities an extra twenty percent add on to be paid for Medicare patients with COVID, and then it created a hundred billion dollar fund uh, that is used to like financially assist hospitals to keep them like their their head above water. Because even before COVID hospitals and the healthcare system are not in great shape a lot of hospitals are like borderline financially insolvent because i mean shit shit's just expensive it's expensive to run a hospital and pay a bunch of doctors uh big salaries so that's why this like act was passed to try and make sure that hospitals were actually financially solvent so that they could keep up with all of the expenses that came with taking on all these covid patients having the icus overrun having to build like additional icus to uh to, to care for COVID patients, to like hire all the extra nurses and doctors that they needed, like travel nurses are getting paid bongo bucks and still are uh, because there's such a nursing shortage nationwide. So like they're, they're, the reality in there is that a political act did a uh, allocate additional funding for hospitals and a portion of that was being used to reimburse healthcare providers. Yes. But with that being said, if you were to actually square that away with like, what are the financials of these hospitals? Like, how are they doing during COVID? And a lot of their quarterly reports actually showed that they were making less money. And that, I think, actually squares away with the idea that we have been undercounting COVID from the very beginning. Uh, the CDC actually screwed up COVID tests at the very start of the pandemic, so we couldn't accurately test people to know how many people even had it uh, starting in March 2020. So, like, we have been undercounting for the entirety of the pandemic. And that's why it feels very almost kind of like funny to like hear people say that online. They're like, oh yeah, everybody's colluding to make hospitals and doctors big bucks by making sure every case is technically a COVID case, even if they just happen to get COVID or if they never had COVID and died from something else. Now there is a separate discussion that's related that 
is the whole did a person go to the hospital so, because so, of COVID? so, oh, so sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. right so so let's let's stay on that real, real sure. quick um so in your opinion there's zero fudged reports concerning covid deaths yeah i I think if they do exist, they are a very small proportion of all like death certificates that list COVID on it. I if don't if if the if there's I, sorry, I got you hypothetical. If there's one million e- e- deaths total, exactly one million people dead from COVID reported, how many would you suggest scientifically? Again, this is like probability. You know what I mean? That's still science. <clears throat> how many of them do you think? were flat out not COVID deaths or would have died anyway and COVID was just put down for the purpose of this conversation? Oof, I mean, that's it's difficult to put a number on it. I would say probably less than 1% of all uh, listed COVID-19 deaths would meet that qualification. I could be wrong on that because, again, like it's hard to even estimate the totality and of how many COVID right. deaths. Like I'll freely admit that I could be very well wrong on that estimate. Uh, but with that being said, like there are a very strict set of guidelines as to how that can even be listed and used to like justify for Medicare billing or for other like medical and insurance billing that's regulated by professional associations for physicians, uh, professional associations for hospitals. And ultimately, it's a crime like the government will crack down on that if they see people doing like COVID-19 Medicare fraud where they're jacking up the amount of like fake COVID deaths. Uh, so they can get reimbursed at greater rates like that is it that's that's a felony like they, they they'll they'll be in hot water if they're actually caught doing that uh so with that being said i think there are some like checks in place to try and disincentivize people from doing that there's rules there's enforcement there's regulation it could be a little tighter and more transparent absolutely but i think at the same time like all of that has to be squared away with we've had a very specific amount of excess death since the pandemic started and it tracks with when we get COVID surges, the excess deaths go up when COVID cases go up. So like what other explanation for the excess death really is there? You know, that it doesn't square with the available data uh, if doctors and hospital administrators were just making this shit up for money. I have a lot of thoughts about this. I don't know how many of my thoughts about this though are rooted in science so much as it is, uh, human nature which isn't really our conversation today um Mm -hmm. my take my takeaway my closing thoughts my takeaway on this concept is that there's probably a not zero percent chance there's probably a not a million to a million perfect um reports and the fact that it's not a hundred percent says like so like you immediately say like oh there's going to be regulations blah 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 but if the regulations are vague and say, Hey, if, if, if the, like you just saying that there are regulations doesn't instill me with any type of confidence because I know that we are capable of instilling regulations that have enough intrinsic loopholes that would benefit the corporation over the individual that, that doesn't necessarily like, like if, if the guidelines are the person has a trace of COVID in their system, when they die, it can count. That could very well be one of the guidelines and all they would need to do at that point as the stage four child dies of cancer uh, is provide a blood test that says they did have COVID when they died. So therefore, this is allowed to be included in the numbers. Does that make sense? Like, I don't disagree with what you're saying and what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It's just that we have a track record and history as a nation of doing things in a way that allows for evil to prevail would you agree with that i feel like that's fair yeah and i think a lot of that is again a financial incentive it uh, money is really at the heart of right. a lot of it so so we would need to know things that would be transparent like cool uh, if you want to take if you want to take the conspiracy theory route and assume that let's say that that hospitals are fudging numbers in order to get um some type of additional funding right what are those numbers like did were they said like hey you have to have 1,000 deaths in 30 days that are attributed to COVID in order to qualify for this, like how big would those fudges be, right? Or are they saying you need 10, like there's a big difference between needing to report 10,000 and needing to report 100 in a month to qualify for that type of, you know what I mean? Like how big are these fudges that we're talking about? But, but again, that this is this feels a lot less like the science portion of it than it does the everything else. So 
I want to transition from this. If, if you, obviously, if you feel as though I'm, I'm steamrolling over something, put your your two cents in. Um, but the the science question that comes from this is like, cool. We are both in agreement that it is not a hundred percent accurate, right? Regard like we might not agree with what that percentage could be. I wouldn't even attempt to put a percentage on it, but I would say there's a not zero percent chance that something weird is being done. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would say that there's a non-zero chance. Uh, I would say that like a lot of the reimbursement is going to come probably like on the individual case level. I think if we're talking about payouts, it might be like on a per case basis, but that does require a fair amount of collusion uh, from a lot of medical staff to actually achieve. And I think that the saying with conspiracies is that like the more and more people that are required to be in on it, the harder the you know web of lies and the coordination gets to maintain. And eventually it all falls apart because you just have so many... Uh, you know, different moving pieces that you can't keep track of all of them. And this is one of those situations where like the, the sheer coordination just to operate a hospital and keep the doors open, let alone, you know, falsify death certificates to put COVID on there to get reimbursement. And it's also worth noting too, that like, even if somebody went to the hospital for a different reason, like they broke a leg and then they got COVID, well, COVID is not going to help whatever situation that person just came to the hospital for. Like people get COVID by going to the hospital for unrelated reasons all the time. It's actually a pretty big driver of COVID transmission. But like a case of COVID is a case of COVID regardless of how you got it. So like that's something that has to be dealt with and the virus doesn't care whether it found you in the hospital or it found you outside the hospital. It's going to do what it's going to do. Um, I, I will kind of square to that all point. away with to like- with uh, the CDC, they're doing whatever they can. They're doing their best to try and estimate like the, the total amount of excess death throughout the pandemic. And just to kind of give you uh, an idea of how badly we're undercounting, you take the current death toll, which is like what we know for sure is specifically due to COVID. You multiply that number by two, and that's the total amount of death that has been caused by the pandemic, whether it was because somebody immediately got sick with the virus or because of some secondary effect of the pandemic, where like they couldn't get to a hospital in time or there was no room in the hospital. Like COVID has a lot of, you know, butterfly effect type ramifications beyond just one person getting sick. So right. that's what's kind of going to fold into that like COVID coding discussion as far as reimbursements for COVID cases is like- So you have catching. to believe, if you believe that there is a doctor out there fudging a report for one patient, there's also going to be a report of one person who died of COVID who never got reported is what you're saying. Like like it, it it's going to fall both ways. Yeah, it, it's going to fall both ways. And I would say more weight is going to fall on the underreporting than the overreporting. And give me, an, give me an idea. So like if, um, w if we say 2020 is the start of the pandemic, uh, the average deaths from 2010 to 2020 were a million every year equal, hypothetically, right? How many would you say in that ratio or scenario would have been 2020, 2021 from COVID? Yeah, so I just like, want to make sure I understand the question correctly. Well, I'm uh, try trying to figure out what the excess amount number would be. So like if exactly okay. a million people died before a million, a million people died every year before COVID, what would that number be once COVID was, in was introduced to be considered excess deaths? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, you probably have to dig into CDC data to like, if we're talking that specific year in a hypothetical, like if we had a million excess deaths per year before COVID started, what would that excess death number look like after COVID? It's going to track pretty closely to what we used to do as far as COVID testing is concerned when we actually were making a more robust effort to figure out how many people actually have it. When we tested a lot more people than we currently are, it would track pretty well with how many COVID cases there are with some extra on top for strain on the healthcare system because uh, that's another component as well. So let's say at uh, at that point in time you had... I don't know, uh, 200,000 cases a day, which translated to another 300,000 deaths per year for COVID specifically, you could say 1,300,000 plus, you know, I don't know, maybe an extra 10,000 on the top just for healthcare system strain. Like that's kind of going to be how you're going to factor that in. Like you're going to have- So you said like, like a 30% like increase in, in, in death, like not the exact number, but the percentage you say was like a 30% increase because of COVID? 
Yeah, I mean the the thirty percent. I'm I'm just like making a hypothetical. Cool. Yeah, estimate. you're and you're also allowed to just bail out and be like, I don't have that data in front of me. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, mean like do you your know, own research. Yeah, right, right, right. Yada I mean, that's, yada that's yada. More, that's more couched in the hypothetical. I think if we're trying to say like in reality what that's going to look like, it's going to track with COVID cases. I would use that as your starting point if you're trying to dig into the numbers. Uh, the actual genuine number of COVID cases is going to give you a more clear cut idea of like when the excess deaths are going to manifest and like however many people were dying from COVID over that time period. Like let's say for uh, January through March, let's say a three month time period, you had, oh, I don't know, like 50,000 COVID deaths. That's probably a low ball, but let's say you had 50,000 COVID deaths in a hypothetical. That would be the bare minimum that you would see reflected in the excess death, you would see 1,050,000. And then you could add a little bit extra for strain on the healthcare system. So you can maybe add another, I don't know, a thousand. So like 1,051,000. If you kind of see like the heuristic, the the way to think about it, you're when you see death from COVID during COVID surges, that's when excess death rises. So you have to like frame it that way to try and estimate like how much excess death is truly running in the background and how badly we're undercounting COVID relative to like what the case counts actually are. What I think I'll, I'll DM this to you. Uh, people have a really hard time grasping like just how much COVID is hanging around at any given time to like put these numbers into context. One really helpful way of trying to get some information on that is what's called wastewater surveillance. What that means is like, 50% of people who get COVID, they actually shit the virus, like they poop it out. So public health officials literally go into the sewer and take sewer water and try to see how much virus is in the sewer water. And I can actually, I mean, I can link this to you right now if you want to see it. But uh, you just sent me a picture of a piece of shit. I'm going to fucking delete oh. this whole interview. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I wouldn't play you like that. I'm not sending you shit pics in the toilet. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Look uh, at this. Here's my proof. <laughs> oh, God. That yeah, looks sick. It, it looks sick. You're right. It looks, it looks real sick. <laughs> but, like, if you were to pull that up, and uh, to anybody who comes across this, if you were to pull this up, this uh, biobot.io slash data website, it'll give you a sense of, like, at the very beginning of COVID, we had a bunch of poop. Uh, virus in the poop water but the case reporting was so low because we screwed up the testing and if you go to present day like there's still a decent amount of virus hanging around but the case reporting is like in in the tank because we're not testing nearly enough as we should be so like it's really difficult just to figure out like how much COVID's hanging around at any given time how does that translate to excess death how does that translate into total COVID deaths how does that translate into billing like it we have so many recursive layers to this it's really difficult to slap a number on it and that's the point that i want to really communicate is that like even in a hypothetical it's still really difficult and the best way to try and estimate how much excess death you're seeing is to see when does a covid surge happen when do you see an increase in virus in the poop water in the sewers that's when you can go look at excess death statistics and look at hospital crowding look at ICU bed occup occupation rates, see if a hospital or a state has a all their ICU beds full. Like those are really good metrics to determine how much mortality and morbidity that you've got going on uh, in at a given time. I'm satisfied. I feel like we talked about a lot of things. Is there anything that's super important to talk about that I'm not smart enough to ask you about right now that we need to we need to address before I get you out of here? Um, I, I think there's, there's, and this is what I was, I think, alluding to, uh, earlier. I, I think it's a, the clean air discussion, I think is a discussion that like never really gets had. And I think it's time people start having it. Uh, I think again, people are very aware about like clean water. You know, you can look at the situation in East Palestine, Ohio, if you want a, a very modern example of why clean water is important. You could look at Flint, Michigan. That's another uh, place that hasn't had clean water for a while. So like people are used to thinking about like, yeah, I, I want to eat food that isn't you know, full of things that are going to give me cancer or kill me. I want to drink water that isn't brown or full of things that are going to give me cancer or kill me. But that is a discussion that we haven't had about air. Like there are things in the air, whether it's a pollutant or a germ, that could probably you know, give you cancer or hurt you or kill you. Uh, and the virus that causes COVID-19 is one of those. So one thing that does not get talked about enough is that, again, another example of how science was wrong, but this wasn't really like a revision that they made. This is more just scientists being shitty about each other. 
one of the biggest debates that didn't need to happen in the scientific community was whether or not COVID was airborne. And what that meant was like, they were still debating whether or not one person at one end of a room could have COVID, exhale it and spread it to somebody all the way across the room. Like they were debating how far away does somebody have to be to give somebody else COVID. And what that led to was like a bunch of governments not acknowledging that the virus is airborne. Like you can absolutely spread it long range from one end of a room to another. Like you can think of it like cigarette smoke, right? You smoke a cigarette, the smoke wafts into the room, it lingers, it kind of hangs out. The virus is exactly like that. Knowing that, one thing that really helps, even if you don't want to wear a mask, I, I can understand why people are inconvenienced by masks. But if you have something like a HEPA filter, uh, a, a little machine that is there to clean the air in the room, you can suck virus out of the air. You can suck it into a machine so you breathe clean air. And this is something that I would argue needs to actually be like a government investment. So like schools, grocery stores, hospitals, gyms, restaurants, everybody has clean air to breathe. I, I think people would uh, really be impressed if they were able to like tell that difference. I personally have an air filter in my apartment magnitudes of difference less crap in the air i'm coughing less i'm sneezing less but i haven't gotten sick so you've I've... created a, a whole new thing that i don't want to uh to let you go before we get into uh number one i need the link for that too um that sounds like something that i, I i'm super interested in here's why i'm interested in it and why it's bringing uh me to the next point wow well, that we absolutely should have fucking talked about huh recovering from fucking COVID, right? So <laughs> yeah. one of my one of my issues while I'm on my fucking deathbed uh, is like I feel like all I'm doing is breathing death into the room, and now I can't leave the room because I I can't even like really get up at this point. And it's like, man, what can I do when I'm feel like I'm trapped in the same place where the virus is just like I'm breathing the virus out and I'm breathing it back in because you know I'm in this like stiffy ass fuck stuffy ass room and shit like that, right? Um, I was told. A uh, thousand milligrams of vitamin C and zinc. Uh, easy just to do like an emergency every day. Uh, tons of fluids and round the clock um, Tylenol, even if you're not showing a fever. That was directly from one of my nurse contacts and was what eventually led to, you know, me feeling better uh, eventually. But if you're saying that there's things like an air filter I could have got for like, you know, what I'm saying the room to, to you know, increase like what, what what would you recommend outside of that? if anything, or is that just good advice for the, the recovering aspect of COVID? Um, well, at least the, the cleaning the air part is, I think, more like squarely on prevention. Um, that's uh, to make like, you know, if you wanted to have like a party with a, if you wanted to have like a house party or something, like just stack a couple of air filters in the rooms where people are going to be hanging out, open a fucking window. Like that's kind of get fresh air in and clean it. People are going to be exhaling their dirty ass air. I don't want to raw dog the air and neither should you. Like that's kind of how I, I communicate it to people. It's like, I, I don't want to breathe dirty air and we can clean it. It's a pretty low hanging piece of fruit. We can do that. Uh, the recovering from COVID side of that discussion, uh, that that's a, a different story because like what you're alluding to uh, kind of after the fact is like, if you're uh, kind of winded or like, if it just feels like it's kind of hard to breathe or like the, the air is really kind of shitty or like you don't really breathe right afterwards uh, that that's squarely like in the long COVID realm, especially if it's been like after a month. Um, one thing that I always tell people if they've had a recent case of COVID is, and this is very much reported from a lot of people who have long COVID don't push yourself and don't exercise. If you're like an avid athlete, don't do that for like a month after having had COVID because there are a lot of people who were like, you know, uh, bicyclists, marathon runners, weightlifters. Like there are people who push their bodies too soon after having COVID and now they have long COVID because of it. They didn't give their body time to rest, time to heal. So just to be safe, it wouldn't be a bad idea for anybody who comes across this. If you ever get COVID, just calm down on the physical activity and try not to stress yourself out for the better part of the next month. Then once a month has passed, then gently start working yourself back into that routine. Now, if you happen to be an unfortunate soul who still has long COVID uh, issues after that, even after following that advice, that's where things start to get kind of complicated. There, there are resources, and I'll, I'll, I'll link this to you as well for the description. It's called Survivor Corps. It's essentially a group of long haulers who have created a map of like long COVID clinics across the U.S. for people to go to like doctors who are specifically trying to treat long COVID so they can kind of see like what you got going on uh, and do what they can to help you. 
but that's the other issue is that like scientifically there are a lot of scientists trying to figure out long covid it's really complicated uh they've got a decent amount figured out so far but there's still a very long way to go uh, and ultimately it's going to be a while before there becomes like a pill you could take or you know, some sort of injection or something like that a treatment for long COVID is still a very long ways away. And that's why I emphasize prevention so much. And that treatment might not ever arrive either. Like I can't tell the future. I would love for it to arrive tomorrow. I would love to hit the fix long COVID now button, but that's not something I have. So uh, as far as recovery is concerned, I wouldn't exercise right away. Definitely try to you know eat well. I think that's reasonable advice that most people would try and do. Eat well, get sleep, rest. Don't push yourself physically or even uh, mentally if you can, and then ease back into your routine after a month. And if you still have long COVID issues going on, then it would be time to, if you can afford it, if you have insurance, because uh, I realize that's not the case for everybody, uh, then it would be time to start knocking on the doors of some long COVID clinics to see if there's something that people can do for you. Uh, that vitamin C and zinc, it's not going to hurt, but it's really not going to help either. I think what did the heavy lifting was your immune system and your vaccines. Okay. There you go. Uh, anything uh, you want to add before you get out of here, my guy? I pretty much said my piece. Um, I think I'll just say thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to again, uh, talk about science, to spread the good word of science. Uh, and it's always nice for people to give science some airtime because that never really like happens in a lot of these discussions, like the one that kind of spurred this discussion in the first place. It was two people shouting at each other, shouting facts and conspiracy theories one way or another. And th there was no scientist in the room. There was no nerd you know, kind of sitting in one of their back pockets to like kind of be the, the arbiter of that discussion. Uh, so I think I will kind of leave on a parting tone of like, uh, you know, us nerds, we're not the coolest people. Uh, you know, we're, we're not the fun people to be around. Uh, but please, like, instead of giving us a swirly or throwing us in a trash can, uh, keep us keep us around because situations like this, we're, we're kind of useful. And it's nice that uh, we can be part of other communities. Now, I wouldn't have uh, imagined uh, talking uh, talking to somebody in like the, the music space because that's not a space that I occupy. So, you know, for, for me, it's really refreshing to like meet new people in other spaces to talk about science because, you know, this is this is an issue that's pretty much everywhere right now. And that manifested in a, a Twitter space discussion that brought us together. Facts. Look, man, this has been super dope. Uh, you allowed me to go and educate myself a little bit. Links will be down uh, in the description for all sources, uh, as well as Amazon products, things of that nature. If you take anything out and you want to up your 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 prevention in your personal life, we encourage that. Um, again, I encourage you guys to do your own research. Uh, it never hurts to know more, especially if you're someone that's experiencing symptoms or experiencing COVID in any way, shape, or form, uh, to go and just get more information from more verified sources, not just the science uh, interview that you watched on the music reaction channel. Um, this is just a really cool idea to uh, to be able to get it in front of uh, additional audiences, additional eyes that you may not have been able to, to have this discussion. And for those like me who get generally frustrated when you try to tap in to get uh, emotionless information and you just end up witnessing streaming matches and things of that nature uh, when literally trying to do like scientific research. So that's my two cents. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to come and chop it up with us today. Uh, this will be up within probably the next 48 hours once I get all the links and everything like that. Uh, as always, guys, I love y'all. I appreciate y'all. I will catch y'all on the next one. Let's go.